Hey there, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight so that we can talk about our plans for reopening Freiburg Academy's campus. And I know we have, um, I'm looking at the number, I think at least 72 folks, 73, joining us live. But I also offer this welcome for the many people who aren't able to tune in live right now, but who will be watching um, a recording of this evening's session. So here are our plans. Um, having sent the framework out to all of you last night, I trust that you've had a chance to review it. And we're gonna move through each section with um, the different people on the leadership team speaking to um, provisions and highlights of the sections. Then we're going to address some questions that came in at my invitation, given the Google form that was sent out to accompany the framework. And then we're going to take a look at the questions that you send in live right now and have the best kind of exchange possible. Um, I don't doubt for a second that you will ask some questions that we do not yet have the answers to. And that will be very helpful for us because it will give us a sense of next steps and specifics to address in the coming four weeks as we continue to prepare for reopening campus. So, okay, so to begin, uh, I wanna mention who else is participating on the panel tonight from the COVID, uh, abandoned calling it the COVID-19 task force a while ago. We prefer to call it the campus reopening um, task force. We have met for about the last six or seven weeks with a lot of work in between meetings by the members of the team whom you've seen identified in the framework document. Tonight, uh, in addition to me, we have Joe Manning, uh, my associate head of school, Joe Mitch, the director of studies, and I'm happy to introduce just ahead of your meeting her visually, Sarah Sartori, who is our new school nurse, Ellen Rainsford, having retired in June. Sarah's been so invaluable in keeping up with the ever-changing guidelines from um, the state. And uh, she, I think, probably will be able to speak to many, many of the questions I imagine that you have about uh, health and safety protocols, especially those most germane to the material in section two of this plan. So to begin, taking a look at the first section, which is education models, I think probably most of you are aware that the state of Maine devised a classification system for each of its counties um, that will inform many decisions at the county level, as well as kind of green lights or red lights at the state level for operations in numerous sectors, including schools. On Friday, July 31st, they um, designated respective counties throughout Maine, one of three uh, categories of virus transmission risk. Uh, green, which is low transmission risk. Yellow, which is moderate transmission risk. And red, of course, which is high transmission risk. Oxford County, along with all the other counties in Maine at that time, um, was designated green, uh, an area of low risk for transmission, which was exactly what we were hoping for and frankly expecting give expecting given our knowledge um, you know, uh, of, of low transmission since the beginning of this crisis in our area. We feel very blessed uh, that we are therefore able to move ahead with in-person reopening plans that have been in the works since June and very heavily, like I said, for the last six to seven weeks. So um, we put before you early in July a modified schedule that is hybrid in nature in that it allows for remote learning, um, you know, full remote learning for students who require that, whether because they are international boarding students who are having difficulties returning to school on time um, because of a variety of travel restrictions and health concerns, or because they're local students with significant health concerns in their households um, who are going to learn from the bill um, until such time as there is an effective vaccine that will make attendance much safer. 
So there's that hybrid provision as well as um, the fact that we will have remote learning for nearly all of our students on Wednesdays in order to um, have an empty campus, do a deeper clean, and just most especially eliminate you know, 20% of the school week uh, as an in-person experience and therefore um, you know, lower the contacts among individuals. I think that really is kind of the, the most salient highlight from this first section that we will continue to be guided by Maine's, uh, the state of Maine's um, designation of Oxford County either as green or yellow or red. Um, also um, have included in this section a diagram of our modified weekly schedule, the one that I just spoke of. And um, the first question that I received ahead of this meeting actually speaks to that schedule and I wanna read it to you and, and answer it here in the event that it's a question any of the rest of you had planned to ask and it's a good one. Um, Here's what, here's what came in on the form. I have heard of a model in which the students will have two days on campus and three days remote. That is Monday and Tuesday for one cohort group and Thursday and Friday for another cohort group with Wednesday remote for all. So school can be deep clean um, and it would have half of the student body on campus at a time rather than all students. Um, on campus at a time. This would help keep class size and hall traffic down, et cetera, and still facilitate socialization. I imagine you've looked at many models. Have you considered this option? So the answer there is yes, we have, and we are aware of any number of um, uh, Northern New England schools who have opted to go in this direction, as well as schools elsewhere in the US that are opening in person, but essentially dividing their student body in half in the way that was described. Uh, the reason that we opted not to do that is really twofold. First, um, the nature of Freiburg Academy's campus, uh, multiple buildings with many open spaces and um, kind of groups of students and traffic contained within buildings on a much smaller scale uh, than if we had a single or two main buildings with one main entrance and you know a, a lot more congestion happening throughout the day. Um, it, it, it really thins out the concentration of students naturally in a way that this, um, you know, this two-day in-person model as described is doing in other places. So the, the geography of our campus already does a lot of work to disperse concentrations of students. Second, going in that direction really means um, a, a vast um, crimp on the number of courses that we're able to offer in a given year. And our hope has been uh, always behind health and safety to stay as close to the educational experience instead of opportunities in reopening as possible. Um, moving ahead, a second question was about students needing direct assistance from teachers, which in the past could have happened in a more private fashion because teachers can approach the desk and lean down and work with a student at a proximity that is prohibited by social distancing. And, you know, the, the, it's a very good question. It is a real problem. I think it's probably a new spin on the older problem of having fairly quiet and reticent students or very self-conscious adolescents not want to be seen to be needing help and um, kind of keeping the need to themselves. Um, this social distance requirement now kind of adds a new dimension to, to that issue. So we're talking about how to best ensure that, uh, that students can receive one-on-one -on -one help in a way that doesn't make them too self-conscious including you know, daily practices of exit tickets of kids you know, writing down what it is that they're continuing to struggle with and that they individually may need help with. We also are adding a lot of structured study hall time in this schedule, which you will have seen by looking at the weekly schedule diagram. We end every um, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday with a 40 minute study hall uh, that is overseen by a student's advisor. And so they're in with 10 or 11 other advisees and their advisor 
uh, working in a directed way on their classes. It's also really an opportunity to do some video conferencing uh, or emailing with their classroom teachers or for those teachers to have informed the advisor of any kind of um, directed study needs that, uh, that may be required at a given time. But I thank you for asking the question. It is something that we're talking about and we're gonna get um, more specific about with teachers and students as we, as we open. Let's see. Third question, when should students expect to receive their schedule? I'm going to let Joe Minich talk about this more fully, but in fact, in order to support all kinds of needs, not all of them connected to remote learning um, or the potential need for more intensive remote learning, but um, we have moved to a new um, educational management system and database system across the board with Blackboard this summer. Uh, their learning management system and everything that Blackbot will also allow for scheduling is very much uh, kind of in motion right now, even as we're, you know, four weeks away from opening school. So we are going to be later than usual and firming up students scheduling requests and their actual schedules, but everybody will have one by the first day of school, which actually used to be the norm. It's just that uh, technology over the years has accelerated um, how soon you know, about the specifics of what their day was going to look like. Uh, Joe, yeah, manager, yeah. speak about that further. Joe? Yeah, let me just jump in here, Aaron. thanks. Uh, so we're gonna return, uh, all of our students who don't return to school until September 8th, it's a Tuesday after Labor Day. Uh, we do have freshman orientation on September 3rd. That will be the latest possible date that schedules will be completed for all students, September 3rd, and students will have access to those schedules at that time. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, it's a new system for us. Uh, it's going well. Uh, our IT department is doing a terrific job, as well as our technology uh, integrator, at working at our migrating over to the new system, but it's, uh, there are other complications besides technology. Uh, we want to make sure everyone is in the correct classes. We want to make sure everyone is in the correct remote learning experience that they've signed up for or haven't, as the case may be. Uh, and we want to make sure everyone's right. So we're going to take our time and look over these, and then we will um, we'll get these out as soon as we can, but we're not going to rush. I see a Thanks. question here that I can probably answer. I think this is germane to this discussion. Uh, from Shelly, uh, what is the plan for students in the music program and band? So Shelly, I've met with Mr. Saycast just yesterday. Uh, we're looking at some outdoor classroom options. This will come up later in the, the, the chat too, but I'll answer it now. Uh, some outdoor classroom options, dividing band into kind of a blown instruments category and unblown <laughs> instruments category for lack of a better terminology. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna make it work. Uh, we're not gonna dump band, it's not, it's a priority for us to have a music program uh, and within, reason, within safety, of course, uh, but we're working with the state of Maine, uh, with Sarah and state, Mike Saycash, the state of Maine and uh, the Maine Music Educators Association to make sure we're in compliance with uh, various recommendations and mandates. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Joe. I'm seeing a number of questions coming in around other classes specifically and I'm going to track them and leave them for you to address sort of on mass when we get to section four which is more specifically about teaching and learning. Absolutely um, I see them there yep that's great. All right there being no sort of further general questions about education models or about our weekly schedule let's move to the second question um, uh, so, and, and, sorry, I, not the second question, the second section, campus reopening. And, you know, this is a fairly short section as written because it bullets the main takeaways about, you know, the preventive measures that we will be, um, that we will be enacting in reopening campus, but they actually tie to a much more developed document, which is our communicable and infectious diseases policy. The link is there. The last five pages of that policy are very specific to COVID-19 and to health and safety measures specific to the pandemic. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Sarah Sartori. 
and invite her to highlight the section and address questions we've already received and those that we receive as she is speaking. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I want to introduce myself. Um, for those of you who I have not yet gotten to meet, my name is Sarah Sartori. I am the new school nurse and student wellness coordinator. Um, so I am working with this wonderful team of people to come up with a plan to safely um, have everybody who wants to return to on-campus, in-person learning um, while at the same time mitigating the risks for COVID-19 um, throughout the campus. Um, these mitigation strategies are focusing on really four pieces, um, the first of which is a daily screening. Um, all faculty, staff, and students will be doing a daily screening at home. Um, it will be a Google form that everyone will have access to. And the requirement is that you do that screening before you get on any type of public transportation or if you're driving yourself or your parents driving you um, before you step onto campus. Um, that screening will ask the basic questions that are put out right now by the CDC about major symptoms of COVID-19. Do you have a fever or chills? Do you have a new cough or shortness of breath? Um, do you, have you been exposed to someone with COVID-19 in the last 14 days? Um, all of the standard questions that I'm sure you're used to answering at this point. Um, and we'll have students take their temperatures at home. We have thermometers if you do not have one, access to one at home um, that you can keep. So those will be our requirements and the answers to all of them need to be no if you wanna to come to class that day. Um, the second mitigation strategy is masking. We're requiring all of our faculty, staff, and students to mask at all times, and that involves using masks properly over their mouth and nose. Um, and I'll be sending out fun videos on how to do all of this. Um, and the only times when masks will be off will be during mask breaks. We'll have scheduled mask breaks in areas where students can be outside greater than six feet apart and take a break from wearing their masks. Um, the other time will be in the lunchroom once seated after they've gotten their lunch while eating or drinking. Um, so those are really the big times that masks won't be worn on campus. Um, if kids need a, a mask break during class, they'll be able to ask their teacher and do that. Um, the third mitigation strategy that we're working on is um, social distancing. So that's gonna be a big piece. We're asking, and we'll have signage you know, around the school reminding kids of this. We're gonna be asking kids to make sure that they have a distance of six feet between them and another student um, or themselves and a teacher or um, staff member. Um, and in classes, kids will be three to six feet apart with masks on at all times. Um, and the fourth piece is hand hygiene. So, you know, if your hands are dirty, making sure you're washing them with soap and water. Other, time, other times using um, our hand sanitizer that will be provided in all of our classrooms, in the hallways, in the cafeteria, um, and any of the major areas where the students will be, they'll have access to um, hand sanitizer. So we'll ask them before they touch commonly used objects and after they use common, touch commonly used objects to perform hand hygiene. Um, and that's, those are, those are our big, um, mitigation strategies. It's what's recommended by the main CDC and the main department of education. Um, so we're really following all of their best practices so that, that we can provide as safe a campus as possible. Uh, Sarah, there's a question I want to alert you to, sure. uh, about are there certain types of masks that must be worn? Uh, a parent had asked that. Great, great question. Um, so yes, we have to have a mask that covers the mouth and nose, um, similar to this type of mask that goes around your ears or can be tied behind your head. Um, that's a really good question. So in terms of what brand or anything, no, there's no criteria in that regard, but we can't do bandanas. We can't do neck gaiters. It's the recommendation is, is a typical mask, um, a cloth face covering. Um, and the CDC website, which I will link everybody to, um, has a, a template for making your own mask, but you can purchase um, on your own cloth mask. We will be providing um, at least one cloth mask per student. 
um, and the guidance is that these, those get washed daily. So my recommendation is actually that people, that kids bring two masks to school in case one gets dirty um, and to bring their own water bottles. Um, we can fill them at the touchless water bottle filling stations, but to try to have them full when you come to school. Um, to bring your own hand sanitizer, if you want, the guidance on that is that it's 60% um, it's alcohol based and 60% alcohol. Um, but yeah, those are, those, and, and even a box, a little, their own little pack of tissues. So we're just trying to, you know, keep your stuff to yourself as much as possible. Um, but that's a really good question. Any other questions for me? Sarah, if you could take a look at the questions that came in on our Google form, the first one that I would direct to your attention was, um, do the all- shot. Right. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Okay, I'll answer this question. Sorry, Erin. Um, so we got a question in advance about whether we will be requiring flu shots prior to the first day of school. The answer to that is no, we are not requiring flu shots prior to the first day of school. Um, we will have a flu clinic for students um, hopefully either September, um, at the latest October this year. The recommendation from the CDC is that um, students, as many as who are capable, get the flu shot. Um, so if you have the ability to get your child a flu shot before they come onto campus, fantastic, go for it. The sooner the better. Um, I hope that answers that question, but it is not a requirement, it is a, is a strong recommendation and it's just as soon as you can. Um, my second question that we got ahead of time was about contact tracing. So there was a parent that brought up a situation where um, they felt like they, they were told that the CDC um, was going to contact them about um, contact tracing. That's something that happened um, last year on campus. So our process for that is that we alert the CDC of any symptoms um, if there are any positive cases that we are aware of, we talk, we work with the CDC and um, their epidemiology department, and they are the ones that actually perform the contact tracing. I will be working closely with them, and I will offer that if I can speed any of the processes up that they are, um, like for notification, um, that I am happy to do so. Um, so I'll be working closely with them and um, making sure that they follow up and follow through with the contact tracing that needs to occur if there happens to be a positive case on campus. Just questions? before that, Sarah, there was a question. If there were to be a positive COVID case on campus, would you transition fully to remote learning? That's a, that's a great question. Um, not necessarily. So that's where contact tracing comes in. That's where the CDC comes in. They offer us guidance on that. So they will talk with that person who has tested positive and they will figure out whether that person has had what they consider exposure, which is 15 minutes or more. Right now, this is the current guideline, 15 minutes or more in contact with a person closer than six feet without a mask on. So not necessarily. Any more questions? Two that just came in include okay. um, as the students asking, I'm wondering about dorm students, how will we be filling out the form every day? And just, I think this is easy enough to say um, right after, um, can students wear blue masks that are sold in packages in CVS and elsewhere? Absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the first question. Um, dorm students will fill out the form the same as any every other student. Um, it will be a Google form that you'll have access to daily and you'll fill it out before you go to the cafeteria, before you go to whatever the first, um, your first activity is. You'll be checked at the cafeteria that you have filled out that form and have answered no to all the questions or, um, and you will be checked at your first period class. Um, so it will be the same requirement for you guys you'll, and you'll take your temperatures in your dorm with your own thermometer and you'll answer all the questions. Um, can you wear the blue masks that are sold in packages in CVS and all the stores? Absolutely. Um, you can wear whatever mask works for you. The CDC recommends right now that we leave surgical masks for healthcare employees as possible. Um, my recommendation is that you wear whatever mask works for you and, and, and allows you to keep that mask on all day. 
Um, my other recommendation for masks, and this is just a personal preference, the ones that have the metal or some type of thing in the nose to help it stay on your nose, those, those can be really helpful. The ones that don't have any kind of um, metal or pliable thing there can fall down under your nose. And, and the idea is that we don't have, want our hands on our masks all day and trying to readjust them and bring them under our nose that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, Okay, so the next question is not for me, I don't believe. It's, it's about Zoom classes. No, I'll, I'll handle that one. Thank you. Sure. I'll handle that when I get to, the, say, to the next section four. Sure. Any other questions for me? You can always contact me. I'll be here. I'm going to send out training videos and more information than you will ever want. So I'm here. Thanks, Sarah. Sure. So we're going to turn section three over to Joe Manning to highlight and to take questions on. Hi everybody, I'm Joe Manning. Um, I'm gonna cover the campus mitigation measures. So we've done a lot this summer and we'll be doing a lot through the school year to keep the campus as safe as possible. I think the most important items are trying to minimize uh, close contact between students and allowing for good ventilation. We're also doing a lot as far as sanitizing surfaces and areas. But again, I think the, the key is the good ventilation, good distancing. So I'm gonna hit on a couple of those things. So first on sanitation of surfaces, we'll be doing that daily. We have uh, good approved sanitation, sanitizer uh, in all classrooms around campus, tons of hand sanitizing stations in every classroom and hallways, outdoors as well, on every table in the dining room. So plenty of places where you can hand sanitize and a good cleaning routine. On both Wednesdays and Saturdays, we'll use our new electrostatic foggers uh, when students aren't on, in the classrooms to, to go through the, the classrooms and the hallways to make sure that we get any of those surfaces that you can't get easily by wipe downs and normal cleaning. Then as far as ventilation, so Freiburg Academy, as Erin mentioned earlier, we have a good advantage that we have a campus where students will often uh, be outdoors, where they're spread out over more than 30 acres on the main campus here, and then 100 if you include down below. And uh, we've purchased now uh, eight tents that we'll be setting outside cam around campus. These are classroom spaces, music spaces, dining spaces. So we're gonna get, try and get kids in classrooms outside as often as we can. We also have spaces in our OLRC, our Outdoor Learning Center, and some other spaces on campus that aren't under tents that people can use uh, for classroom space when it's conducive. Another thing that we've done um, in the back of this plan, you will find the campus maps uh, for traffic flow. Let me just shift over to that file. Give me one moment here, just to show you the main page. Okay, hopefully you can see the campus map now. Uh, you'll see this is the outline of the whole campus, but we have designated points of entry where students Excuse will me, enter Joe. buildings. Joe, sorry, it's not, um, it's not showing. It's not showing, okay, hold on. It's, we're looking at Joe Manning's screen and he's trying to go to the attachment, which is the traffic flow. How about now? Here we go, great. All right, Thank perfect. You. Okay, so you'll wanna look through this. There's actually 13 different pages. I'll go through it with your students. That would be helpful ahead of time. Um, each building has its own traffic flow, so we will avoid that. I'm sure, sure many of you have seen pictures of that classroom, the school down in Georgia with, you know, looked like a thousand kids in a hallway. Freiburg Academy is not really designed that way anyways. In our new schedule, we have 10 minutes of passing time, so we'll be able to kind of let people flow through in a more um, gradual manner. And also they'll only be going one direction, many times going outside between classes uh, to make that route. So that's kind of uh, an important thing for our students to learn. We'll have lots of signage uh, to that effect, but I think that's another way we can help um, prevent the virus. Uh, one of the most important things we're learning about the virus is that it is most common that it's um, transmitted by um, droplets in the air. So as Sarah said, mentioned, the mask is real important. We also think ventilation is important. So we've, um, we've eliminated two or three classrooms where we didn't think there was adequate airflow. Uh, in every other classroom on campus, there are windows, there, uh, there's a fan being installed in every classroom that will blow out 
to blow out uh, the stale air. Another window will be open to bring in fresh air. So each classroom, all of our dorm rooms, many of our common spaces will have this airflow. Again, we also have many modern buildings here on Fryberg Academy and all of them have great new ventilation systems, places like our dining hall, um, library, the arena and those things. Things like the arena will, um, you know, I know that fitness centers are a great concern uh, as they should be. Much of our fitness classes will take place outside. We have a tent that we've located behind the gym where we'll put many of our weights so many of the fitness classes can meet outside that way. Let me make sure I hit some of the questions that some of you have um, as far as library use. Uh, there will be some limitations on library use, but we will still have it open. Uh, it won't be open every evening as it was in the past. It may be for students who are on campus, but we are asking day students to kind of leave campus um, at sunset, if you will. So after, after sports games end, uh, it'd be a good time to go home. So kind of a curfew, if you will. Um, Another question regarding laptops being provided to students. Yes, that was a question on the form on returning to school. So if you filled out that you needed a device, um, we've uh, accommodated for that. We've purchased additional Chromebooks and each student who needs one will be given a device to use for the year as we won't be using um, shared carts anymore as that is a point of um, too many people having contact on the same, same device. So please make sure you filled out that chart if you didn't already. Um, you'll need to contact us because we need to make sure we have enough devices. We are encouraging students if they have their own device to bring it to school each day because sometimes uh, it will be used in class that way because we can't have a whole group go to the computer lab per se anymore. And then the electrostatic uh, foggers, I mentioned those. So those are gonna be used when students are not on campus in the classrooms and we'll also use them in other areas uh, when students are not there. And then I mentioned the fitness classes. So I think those are the questions from ahead of time. Are there additional questions on this section? Yeah, Joe, so um, as, we've, as we've heard from some other groups prior, uh, what are plans in winter and colder temperatures, given that you know, we're talking about some outside options that are clearly seasonally specific? And then a question about how will classrooms be ventilated in the winter when windows may not be able to op be open? Yeah, so th those are great questions and we'll continue to work on those. We are actually purchasing some um, HEPA air filters as well. But even in the colder temperatures, it's likely that we'll encourage um, a bit of the windows being opening and some you know, fresh air coming in. Um, that's happened at Freiburg's campus for a long time. Students moving between classes, going outside. You know, it's part of becoming to Maine, right? Learning how to endure some cold temperatures. But we know that fresh air is really important. So we're gonna continue to work on that and continue to work on our options um, for the winter time. I might add that, you know, the biggest driver of a significant purchase of tents on our part um, is the fact that we can't have more than 50 people in our dining room at a time as an indoor space. You know, and clearly we need more students than 50 to be having lunch across the three shifts. So um, we will, as weather permits throughout the fall, have these tents set up so that students can be eating outside. Uh, we are on target for an on-time completion of the new student union, and that will be early October. So when that happens, that does open another really um, spacious indoor area for another 50 students to eat in addition to the 50 in the dining room. And then we'll work on assigning other indoor areas uh, for lunch, you know, as we move into the colder weather. So uh, the, the, the biggest need there that will need to be accommodated as the weather changes is going to be driven by um, the midday meal and uh, the SU is, is gonna address a large part of that need. Yeah, another item to, to point out on that, uh, Joe Minich may talk about it more, but when, you know, at Freiburg, our average class size is just 14 students. So it's a nice small size in what are generally fairly large classrooms. But if we identify a class in a room where we think the room should be larger, we have nice large spaces on campus like our PAC, our gymnasium, our dining hall, um, our new student union where we'll be able to sign those classes. And um, I don't know if, we, if you saw this part of the plan, but it's in there that 
most of our campus is closed to visitors. So things like our Performing Arts Center that in the past and our gymnasium that's been used a lot for outside groups during this time will just be used for Fiber Academy students. Do we have further questions on campus mitigation measures for Joe? If not, actually, before we move on to talk about educational program, I, there, there are two actually that we missed because they were um, in a different section than Sarah's, but they really are hers to answer. So Sarah, uh, first, has any thought been given to regular COVID-19 testing on campus? And as a second, I think, related question, will any form of either virus or antibody testing be part of measures used to ensure a safe in-person school opening? Those are great questions. Um, unfortunately, at this time, we don't have access to the testing to be able to test everybody. The CDC is not recommending screening of students and faculty prior to opening of in-person schooling. We are testing our dorm students upon arrival and they are going through a quarantine process once they are here prior to them being able to um, join the rest of the campus and follow the same masking and um, social distancing and hand hygiene uh, protocols as the rest of the students. Um, we are encouraging faculty and staff and any students who want to, to go get tested. Right now, the majority of insurance companies are not uh, providing, are not paying for testing um, for asymptomatic people. Um, so, I will have the opportunity to, like I said, test those dorm students, um, but we are other, other than that, we cannot require it, but it is certainly recommended, and if you have the ability to do so and a provider who will order that for you, that's, not, that, that's fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of more testing, but we cannot require that at this time. Does that answer both of those questions you think, Erin? I think so, thank you. Okay, sure. Looks like we're in good shape to move on to section four. Great, thanks, Aaron. So section four, uh, Aaron has talked quite a bit about the schedule that we've come up with. Uh, Wednesday's remote and Tuesday, or Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, not remote. Uh, I think it's worth uh, looking at that a little more closely, not the actual schedule itself, but the kind of the concept behind the schedule. Uh, somebody had asked earlier um, whether it would be, what would happen if we uh, had a case? What if we had to go remote? Sarah correctly answers that the CDC will guide us in that scenario. But I think it's the most important thing to note is that we will keep the same schedule whether we're remote or in person. If we were suddenly forced to go fully remote for a period of time, maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks, we would be absolutely fine to just go on with the same schedule. So I think that's, that's an important thing to remember is that your kids won't be scrambling trying to figure out what uh, what classes when it'll be the same as any normal school day. Uh, that's really important to us. We don't want people scrambling as much as possible. Uh, it's, it's stressful enough in, in times like these. So I wanted to go over a couple of scenarios uh, that we've looked at. Um, so we've already covered, I think, the first bullet point here in section one, or section part, subsection one, uh, which is classes that have fundamentally different safety environments, such as fitness, band, and chorus. Uh, fitness will be outside as much as possible. We'll use the larger gymnasium arena section rather than the actual uh, fitness center if weather is bad, if potentially. Uh, band and chorus, I mentioned already. I think somebody put a question in here about theater somewhere. I saw that. Oh, yeah, that was in my... Uh... Woodworking. Yeah, so theater, woodworking. Those are all great questions. Um, so we're working with those teachers of those classes as well as their uh, relevant kind of associations at the state and national level to see what the best practices are. I know Mr. Polito in the woodshop uh, has his own concerns that we're working to address. Uh, you know, with sanitation of shared devices and shared tools, that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, we're going to figure it out. We're, we're committed to having all of our electives. It's really important to us to offer a full educational experience here. And so we're going to make it happen. Uh, it's going to be pretty interesting uh, at times. And it'll have to change some of the things we, we normally do. I think Joe Manning likes to say that, you know, everything we normally strive to do, we kind of have to they rethink a little bit and sometimes do the opposite of what we normally do. Um, but in this case, we'll, 
will make it all work. <clears throat> uh, Pequaka Valley Alternative School is certainly a different situation where it's more of a self-contained student cohort. So I'm working with those two teachers, uh, Didi Frost and David West, to develop uh, essentially classes where the students are there when they need to be there and are not when they don't. Uh, Lake Region Vocational Center, there's a question about diversified occupations earlier in the chat. Um, so the question there is, uh, there's, it's actually pretty simple. Lake Region is gonna be on, they're starting a little later than we are. They're starting on the 14th now, uh, but they are in person uh, as much as they can be, as much as is allowed at the state level. Uh, we'll be sending our students there on buses. Uh, we'll be sending our students back for, by bus. Uh, Sockaby Valley High School, which is another local high school, will be sending their students there as well. Uh, so Sarah Sartori has coordinated with their nurses of the two schools, uh, and they're going to make sure that we're up on everything that's happening within those schools. They have an email, or maybe even text chain, I don't know. Maybe some sort of TikTok, I have no idea. Um, probably not. Uh, and so they're, um, they're coordinating on that, but we, you know, we we know the Lake Region is going to be as safe as they can be. They have an excellent facility with lots of extra, lots of space, uh, and so they'll be as safe as we can be, and we will too in that regard. Uh, there'll be a very few handful of students who will be here on campus on Wednesdays. Uh, students who have maybe some physical disabilities or other things that need um, need a higher level of intervention. Uh, substitute teachers, uh, working with our substitute coordinator uh, to develop this. If you have anybody who wants to sub, we'll take them. Uh, but we are um, developing some kind of fallback plans in the case we can't get adequate subs, which may be a problem, uh, you know, honestly. But we're looking at some different uh, options there, like remote learning for those individual teachers who can't make it to campus on a given day. Uh, and finally, the bus transportation to getting kids to and from school. Uh, the district, uh, MSED 72, is in charge of bus transportation. I think it's worth noting that they are encouraging people who can transport their students to school or students who can transport themselves to school to do so. That doubles for Lake Region. If kids can get there on their own, uh, it's definitely preferred because uh, some, buses are going to be tough. Uh, there's no sugarcoating it, but buses, not the safety of buses, but just the amount of students that can safely ride a bus. So if you can get your kid to school or your kid can walk to school or your kid can bike to school, plan for them. Obviously cold weather changes things as we've discussed already, but we gotta be flexible with this stuff and we've gotta kinda do what we can to help everyone out. So I think that's it. Uh, let me see if there's any more questions that came in while I was, I have some questions that are coming on the pre thing. Oh yeah. Um, so a question here is, it will be possible for Zoom classes on Wednesdays to be recorded? Yes, so we may not record every single aspect of every single class, but we'll certainly ask our teachers to record those sections with, that uh, they feel they deem necessary that may be, needed, that may be necessary for students to watch later. Um, but yes, absolutely. Uh, and then another question, we do, are gonna go to a quarter system. Uh, so you're right, uh, this person's correct. They have traditionally been two semesters. We're still gonna have two semesters, but they'll be divided up into half each, so for four quarters total, as well as May term at the end, hopefully. Uh, so the reason for that is so that students can go, well, two reasons. One is to give us more discrete grading periods. I think that was really important that kind of coincidentally happened this year. We were able to grant quarter credits rather than just half credits as traditional because we went to, we essentially went remote at, at the middle of the semester. But this is gonna kind of formalize that a little more that like if we reach a certain point, we can say, okay, we're granting credit for this quarter much more easily than we could have done last year where we had to do all manual entry. The other thing too, this gives us our international students target dates if visa restrictions change, that they can come to the country and quarantine and all that. Um, but it give them kind of target dates to, to, to shoot for. So I hope that answers that question. Um, the, the, so the grades, will, all four quarter grades will go on the report card. So that's a big change, um, but it's, I think it's a better system because we need to be more flexible. We need more more agile. Uh, what will DO students do in the morning for the first week? Uh, that's a great question. When I'm working with the Dean's office to determine, uh, we will likely, this DO, morning and do afternoon because there's nine and ten. Uh, we will work on getting some either activities or we will work on potentially busing them home. Uh, I see a question about parking here. Uh, parking, it's a good question. I didn't, <laughs> I honestly hadn't thought of that. 
Uh, no, I can't answer that one. Yeah, Joe, um, you want to answer that? Yeah, so we, we actually have plenty of parking on campus. Currently, our faculty and staff park in the main teacher's lot and the students park in the student lot, and it's not currently full each day. We also have use of the American Legion lot across the street from the student lot. That's pretty much empty all day. So more than enough parking, I think, even if every student drove to school. And I'm pretty sure the freshmen can't, so we'll be in good shape. Uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, will students be traveling in cohorts or will they mix in as in the past? Uh, we're not gonna be having cohorts. It's almost impossible at the high school level to have true cohorts. Uh, Aaron discussed some of the reasoning behind that for not having like larger cohorts. But unlike at the elementary school level, you can't simply have a teacher come into a classroom and say, teach math, and then another teacher come in and teach English to the same group of kids. It just doesn't work. Um, so, you know, we looked into that. It was just, it's not feasible at this level of, of school. One, one thing we will do related to that is we will be assigning seats in each classroom and in the dining room as well, so that we know that each, each area is only used by a certain number of students and who those students are um, each day. And then also the end of the day study hall is the same group every day as it's with the advisor. So um, in some ways there are groupings that kind of naturally form, but as Joe said, it's not quite as clean. Uh, a couple more questions here, lots of questions. Uh, there are actually, so it's an interesting question. Uh, this is a question about Lake Region once again. How will the schedule work now that there are only two classes in the afternoon? So there are two classes in the afternoon on Monday and there are two classes in the afternoon on Wednesday, uh, sorry, on Tuesday, Friday. So Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday combo. Uh, so it actually gives more class opportunities for Lake Region if necessary. Uh, we can build in some study halls and things like that advisory period, that sort of thing. So it's actually, there's no limitation on um, the number of classes that Lake Region can take as compared to other years. Um, let's get to a couple more. Let's see, do I have any more? I have a few for my sheet here. Oh, will there be any changes, change to curriculum for those staying with remote learning? There may be some. Uh, we're not gonna be able to offer all of our electives remotely uh, if we're all not all in person, uh, not all remote. Um, we simply don't have the, the resources to do that. We can't offer something like fitness remotely uh, or medals or something like that uh, at this time. So the remote learning students will be taking four core academic classes and potentially one elective. Uh, we're gonna work on that exact scenario. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, one that we are <clears throat> developing as we speak, well, not as we literally speak, but every day now. <laughs> um, I'm not sure there's a question here about do children get to pick their cohort groups? Uh, I think we just explained that we don't have specific cohort groups. Are you referring to a, I'm not quite sure what that's asking. I think, I think that this is, um, so MSAD 72 is going with a cohort group approach uh, and, and we are not. Students will continue to move among different locations across the day according to their academic schedule and therefore they'll be with different fellow students and, and teachers throughout the day, um, but we are mitigating the risk in all of the ways that we're describing here preventively um, with masks and, and social distancing and traffic patterns, um, et cetera. So Heather asked a good question here. What about AP courses? I'm assuming you mean if they're remote. Uh, so we are committed to offering all of our core academic classes online. Uh, at some level. Uh, we have our world classroom, which we described last meeting, which has many AP courses in it. You may not be able to take a specific course. There may be like one or two courses that you're not able to take uh, remotely if you offer remote, but for the most part, we offer everything remotely other than the electives. Uh, let's see, I, I wanted to address, there's a couple little questions here, but there's kind of a nice gesture here. Someone says, a heartfelt thank you to all faculty staff for these innovative, thoughtful solutions. What can we parents do to support you? Any needed supplies or other needs? I think we're okay on supplies, right, Joe Manning? Yeah, so we've ordered um, quite a bit of supplies related to, you know, uh, cleaning, uh, PPE, masks, disposable masks, cloth masks, um, all of those pieces, tents. Uh, and we also do expect additional supplies to arrive um, from the state. Um, through supply they're doing there. So I think we're okay on supplies. We'll certainly um, put a call out there as things go. Um, but there are, you know, additional expenses and things related to that this year. So thanks for everyone who can support the academy. Um, there are a couple questions related to transportation here that I'm happy to pick up um, and actually lead to some other things. So um, 
kids are allowed to drive to school with other kids, but you know, this is actually one of the most um, challenging parts of the whole virus is we, we control about six hours of the day here at best, right? Um, so what kids do outside of the classroom and outside of the school day is really important. So we are encouraging all our students and Aaron will get into this later on our community co compact to, um, you know, to do the best they can to follow all of the, the protocols. Uh, required as far as socially distancing and not having big groups and large gatherings and all those pieces. Um, so the study hall and lunch assignments, uh, they, the students will pick them um, on their first day uh, where they're sitting in those spaces and we'll, uh, we'll mark that down and they'll be like, okay, when you sit inside in the dining room, this is your table. Uh, so they do have some choice on that. As far as assigning um, seats within classes, that will be a teacher by teacher decision, right, Joe? Yeah, so we'll have the teachers decide and then they can move kids if necessary, but most likely we'll stick to what's, uh, what's working. Right, there's a couple more questions here. Uh, yeah, we do have, um, as far as cleaning the classrooms between classes, we do have a 10 minute period, a 10 minute class period. So anything, any shared surface, shared device uh, will be cleaned between classes. Good question, Emily. Uh, good question, Heather. Uh, so Heather asked a follow-up question for the AP classes. Uh, so for many AP classes, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say for many, for about half of our AP classes, there will be students uh, learning in person. So for like AP Calculus is a great example. AP Calculus AB will be offered one section in person, one section remotely. We have many students who take AP classes who aren't able to make it to campus for international reasons or others, or have opted remotely. So they'll be taking those classes um, those will be taking those classes remotely. Students on campus will be taking those classes in person. There are some classes uh, like AP Statistics or AP Chemistry that will only be offered remotely. Uh, so that's a terrific question and one that's uh, hard to answer thoroughly, but I think that gives you the gist. And I, Heather, if you wanted to email me, I can answer the, could give you the full list. It's on our website as well. Um, you know, there's a question here from Ingrid about um, drop-off time. So our first yeah. class in the morning starts at 7.50. Our campus yep. pretty much opens up at 7. So any time between 7 and 7, 7.50 is fine for drop-off. Yep. Our classes end at 2.35. Uh, and we ask kids that aren't involved in after-school activities to get picked up between that time and about 3.15. So we have pickup locations both um, at our gym, that's where a lot of busing happens. So it's great if, if families can pick up students either somewhere along Bradley Street or in, in the front main loop of the of the school. Uh, Joe, there's a question for you uh, about the bathrooms clean bathroom cleaning. Sure, the same thing. We'll be doing cleaning throughout the day. Um, again, would as much as possible and encouraging students to wash hands after going to the bathroom. Um, and we have quite a few bathrooms around campus and we have more uh, individual bathrooms in the past. We'll also have signs on the bathrooms um, that, that we don't want multiple people in bathrooms at a time. Um, so we'll try, try to minimize um, how many people use a bathroom at one time so we can um, keep them pretty clean. Uh, that's a great question. Uh so we have a question about chemistry and I think all the lab sciences. We're looking at some software that will replicate labs as much as possible. It's not every chemistry and every science class that will be offered remotely. Just mostly, most of those will be in person. There are a few, like I mentioned, AP chemistry, which is a, a funny class because it's a, it's a paper exam uh, for a chemistry class. Uh, and so we're going to try to do our best to replicate labs using this, soft, this piece of software called Pivot. Uh, and then we're going to have a rely on our awesome teachers to kind of fill in the rest. Uh, and it's a, it's, you know, it's a difficult situation, but they have proven up to be up to the challenge. Hey, Joe, yes. I'm going to take a look at a couple of the questions that came in before the meeting. One yeah. I can answer quickly uh, myself, what's happening with SATs? Um, will people, you know, who registered be getting a refund for the August SATs that were canceled, you know, to be offered on campus? Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, they can either, uh, uh, they can either have a refund or we're going to be offering a school day SAT in October. Right. And you can also roll that into, roll the fee into that. Right, you'll have the option to just re-register for the one that will happen in October on campus or to get the refund. Um, I think I would um, direct you to the question 
this goes back to uh, fitness and, and use of the gym. Will day students be allowed to work out in the gym after school and what protocols are in place for limiting the number of students in the gym at one time? What are the cleaning protocols, et cetera? Great, I can answer that one. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we'll have our fitness equipment, a fair amount of the weights uh, outside and we will have after school um, fitness hours um, utilizing the, um, the trainers from Mountain Center as we have in the past. Um, so that will be an option. It will be uh, more limited, but it will be outside so we can uh, physically distance well um, because we know how important it is for kids to maintain their uh, physical uh, health as well as their mental health um, through all of this. And that's gonna keep them healthy and help um, fight off all kinds of viruses. And Joe, we, we got a separate communique with question or enthusiasm, but like further questions about provision of hotspots for people who have great difficulty with their Wi-Fi connections. Yeah, uh, so the state has provided some hotspots. Uh, I'm not sure quite how many we have, but we're gonna work to get to those get those to the people who need them. Uh, I think in the fall, we asked people to, or sorry, in the spring, it uh, seems like a long time ago. Uh, in the spring, we asked uh, a technology survey with the need devices and we asked that question again, whether people needed devices. Uh, if you feel like you need a hotspot and you don't have access to one, please email me uh, and we'll see if we can make that connection. One, one important note there is, um, we, you know, those of us like me who live in the nether parts of Brownfield don't necessarily have a place where a hotspot would even work. Um, we've, we've discussed, you know, possibilities and, and uh, ways of setting up locations for those students who just can't get any kind of connectivity at their houses of having a space where they can work here um, on Wednesdays. Uh, we don't want kids to kind of not have the opportunity to um, do their remote Wednesday. Right. Um, so we, you know, it would still be a pretty sparse campus, uh, but we'd love to make that work for uh, any, um, any student who can't basically connect to the internet either by hotspot or by Wi-Fi um, at their home. Uh, percentage numbers for how many will stay remote versus on campus? That's a good question. Can we disclose that, Aaron? Well, we have it in the document, so that's okay. We yeah, have actually, we have just under 40 area students uh, who've indicated that they will begin now. the year remotely. Yeah, it's slightly over 40. We had a few more come in. Oh, is it? Okay. Slightly over. Yeah, it's very slightly. I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a question um, most relevant to section two, and I'll toss it to Sarah. What's the plan when someone in the FA community has a positive COVID test? So I'm presuming this means kind of a second degree um, contact from a student or an employee. Um, absolutely, good question. Um, if anybody in the Freiburg Academy community tests positive for COVID, we will work hand in hand with epidemiology um, at the main CDC to do contact tracing. And the main CDC, the main Department of Education, our local health officer and us will work together to come up with the best solution. It could be um, closing certain classrooms. It could be closing the school for two to five days while we figure out what the spread looks like. Um, but we will be following their guidance. We always reserve the right to close campus um, at any time and go to fully remote learning if necessary. Thanks, Sarah. I'm looking sure. at the next two questions and one of them regards athletics, which I'll speak to kind of generally in a moment. Um, what about the September SAT? So Heather, here's our difficulty with both the August and September administrations and potentially uh, dates further into the future. Um, we are a testing site for the SAT, um, you know, as designated by the college board, but the college board is not permitting schools that are testing sites to offer the test unless they offer it to any student from anywhere who registers to take it at that site. So we can't make it available to Freiburg Academy students who are geographically contained and who are compliant with our community compact. We have to, if we offer it on a Saturday, um, according to their designated testing dates, we have to open the campus to students from 
uh, potentially really anywhere who would be in the area at that time and desiring to take the test at our location. It's unfortunate. We don't really know why they're insisting on that um, provision, but it we, we can't, um, you know, keep the campus preventively safe according to everything that we're working on right now and open the campus to, you know, students from parts unknown. So I am going to presume that we are not offering the September test. Uh, the one that uh, we, we are offering, yep, sorry, Aaron, if I can jump in here. We're okay, not, uh, until further notice, we won't offer any Saturday SATs. Right. The restrictions Aaron, or the non-restrictions Aaron uh, refers to are in place for Saturday SATs only. Right. We will right. give a school, as I mentioned earlier, we'll give a school day SAT, which is a Wednesday. I believe it's uh, October 14th. Uh, right. So that will be the time that your students can take the SAT. I think it's worth noting in conversations with our college counseling or school counseling department that many schools are moving away from requiring SAT because of coronavirus. Uh, so it's, I mean, obviously when our students take the SAT and do well, but if it doesn't happen in October, it's not necessarily the biggest disaster. Um, but we'll right. work. So the, so the Saturday, so the Saturday date is in fact, a, I'm sorry, the September date is a Saturday administration and That's will correct. not be offered. That's correct. Um, yep. At Freiburg Academy. And, and so um, I'm going to presume that you're, you're, you're going to be offered the same opportunity either to choose a refund or roll the fee forward for the October. Um, yes. For the school day. School That's day correct. Administration. Yep. yep. So I guess I'd speak to extracurriculars and athletics at this point, yeah. um, because that is the other that is the other I, piece uh, of the education. Actually, can I answer one? Can I ask you one sure. question? Oh, sure. Go ahead. There's a couple questions about diversified occupations on Wednesday or Lake Region class on Wednesday. Uh, so if, I just want to make sure I saw two of these. So um, you, if you can get your student there on Wednesday, then they can go. If they can't, then they'll have work to do through Lake Region remotely. Uh, so they're not going to be penalized. They're not going to be counted as an absence. They'll just have to do some work on their own. Uh, so I just want to make sure we answer, we, uh, answer that before we missed it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no problem. Uh, so the other half, of course, of, of a student's educational experience is the co-curricular and the extracurricular piece. And, you know, we, we um, prize this highly and are very glad that we've been designated, you know, green um, so that we can feel confident that adhering to all of these health and safety protocols um, in a club setting, uh, you know, makes it as, as feasible for us to continue with clubs and extracurriculars as it does academic classes. So yes, we will continue to offer, you know, the host of, um, of clubs which meet both during the school day and after school. And actually, as was pointed out yesterday, we have one very significant club that meets before school and that's interact and it has a lot of student members and um, you know so we'll we'll figure out what the angles on those things might be interact for example meets at seven in the morning which would mean that on those days we have to have a different kind of screening intake procedure not period one but um, whoever's running the meeting um, will get the data on uh, screening forms having been completed but we're really committed to continuing to offer uh, those experiences that are very interest driven or new interest driven for students and that they prize um, that they prize so much athletics um, is a, a, a very significant category among those offerings and in this area we are guided by the MPA um, and uh, the guidelines that they are offering and as many of you know they have um, they have advanced a, a four phase um, re-entry into physical activity and hopefully team activity in the fall and right now we are in phase three and about to begin phase four all of this is preschool year um, activity uh, it has not been formally authorized yet but we're told it's likely that the MPA given all of Maine County's designations as green and at low risk for virus transmission, that it is gonna give the thumbs up to a competition season for all of our fall sports teams. And if it does, and we're waiting um, uh, 
for that green light. But if it does, that competition season will begin with our first day of school, September 8th. Um, our teams will compete. Uh, most teams will have, I think, 10 competitions. I think football is slated to have six. But the most uh, important aspect of, of athletics operations is going to be that you know, the athletes in practice and in competition will be wearing masks. Uh, there are many, many other questions about health protocols uh, for the athletes, uh, for potentially competitions um, on campus and whether or not there will be spectators and how that will work. And the MPA will offer, will offer regulatory guidance on how to manage all that. So we've gotten a lot of very good questions about what's that going to look like. Um, you know, as far as people coming to watch the games and will there be refreshments available and um, will uh, families have access to the buildings for rest, you know, for restrooms, um, how will the locker rooms work for all of the athletes, et cetera. And uh, what we can tell you is that we are confident that if the MPA um, uh, says it's a go on the fall season, that they will be supplying us with the answers to most or all of those attendant questions. Um, so that's to be continued, but we think, we, think that, um, we think that some answers there are imminent. Aaron, there's a question in the chat about a musical. Do you have any answers about that? Sorry, you, you sending that to me? No, I, I think um, a musical in the first semester is, is no. Um, yeah. we, we are very hopeful that any number of things that are delayed are, are just going to be delayed until sometime in the second semester, um, you know, depending on public health developments. But um, in the first semester, we know that there will not be one. Uh, good question about homecoming. I don't know what that will look like, but we like homecoming. And um, you know, if there if there is an athletic season, we will uh, we will design something um, that is appropriate for the for the season that we're in. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. I appreciate your encouraging remark. I think we're in good shape. Sorry, turning on the mic again. I think we're in good shape to move to brief treatment of Section 5, which is specific to residential life. Um, I know that we have some um, resident students and families joining us right now for this session. Please know that we will be running uh, a, a video conference meeting for resident student families um, that treats all of this more extensively, specifically for you within the next week or week and a half. Um, Joe Manning and Beth Ross will be getting you more information about that. But there are some points here uh, to cover and uh, I'll turn it over to Joe. Yeah, so I think Sarah touched on um, earlier, one of the more important points that people ask about is that we do have a quarantine procedure and testing procedure in place as, um, as resident students arrive on campus. Um, a couple of key notes to, for everyone in our community, um, the residence halls will start with just Hastings Hall and Fry Hall open. Those dorms will only be open to the people who live in them. So um, day students and students from other dorms uh, won't be able to visit those dorms. Those, those dorms this year um, during the time of the virus will just be uh, for the people who live in them. Uh, but we do hope that day students and uh, boarding students continue to make friends and meet each other and have social time. So we'll have lots of outdoor spaces on campus where people can be physically distant, uh, make new friends and have a good time. Um, one other important um, point in this section is that it does cover our meal protocols. Um, so all of those things that we touched on a little bit earlier uh, with campus mitigation factors, we do have um, the tents outside for people to eat, the multiple lunch periods. Um, we, um, want a couple of things to note, 
So we won't, uh, during breakfast and lunch, students won't be able to get um, seconds anymore, but they will be able to ask for uh, more food during their first time through the line. We wanna make sure everyone's well fed. Um, we wanna to continue to have good, healthy options that are very tasty. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep that up. Our, our dining hall staff does a great job. Another thing to note is that on Tuesday afternoons during that study hall period, we'll have a protocol time and a plan where students who desire to pick up a breakfast or lunch for Wednesday can come through and purchase that um, with, their, with their meal card um, at the end of the day and bring that home for Wednesday. So any family that um, purchases or relies on our food on Wednesday, we'll have that. And then of course, um, the dining hall will be open on Wednesdays for um, those students who are still on campus, the resident students and other um, limited day students who need to be on campus um, that day. So we are, um, we're optimistic that we'll open with around 50 boarding students on campus. They'll be coming in uh, throughout this month. We have more students signed up who would love to be here on time as well, uh, but due to travel restrictions and visa delays, that will take some time. But we hope maybe by mid-year to be back to our kind of regular number of the last few years, around 100 or so uh, boarding students from more than 20 different countries. I think there were a few questions in this section. Um, this year, the largest group uh, in the dormitory at the beginning of the year will be from South Korea. Uh, we also have students from several countries in Europe, Africa, um, around the US as well. Uh, we have still many students who wanna come here, uh, enjoy our beautiful environment and come to our uh, great school. So uh, we're excited about that, excited to, to again meet kids from all over the world and see students from, um, from Brownfield to the other side of the world um, connect on a day-to-day -day basis. Other questions in this section? I see no open questions on the screen. Joe, um, actually there, there are two further that came in prior to the meeting. The first one I think we've addressed, but again, between you and Sarah, I, I, I think it's really important for our local community to be comfortable that we have the right protocols in place for students who are joining us from out of the area. So I would just, I would just read it again. Um, as far as testing before and upon arrival at campus, how, how does that work for our students coming into the, into the dorms from elsewhere in the country and, and around the world? We are, I can answer that. Um, we are requesting that everybody have a negative test prior to travel for international students um, apparently, this is not optional. They need to show a negative test in order to travel. Um, once they arrive on campus, they will be quarantined. We will test all dorm students within two days. Um, that's our plan, within two days of arrival. And upon their negative test screening, after at least five days of quarantine, by the time we get the testing back, um, we they will, at that point, move into their dorm room in either Hastings or Fry. So they will start in a, in, a, in a different dorm and we will quarantine and test them first. Does that make sense? Does that yeah, I think that's great, Sarah. And I think a couple of things to note is we will have a on-campus option during all of our holiday breaks. Um, so students yeah. don't need to travel as much. Uh, we'll be limiting um, the places we go through our residential program to uh, stay within the safe places as designated by the uh, state of Maine and, and by our own following of um, where cases uh, case numbers are low. But I think it's going to be a great program and I think um, we're going to do our, our best to keep, keep students safe. We do have, um, as Sarah mentioned, one location we've designated as the quarantine location where people come. And if unfortunately we did get a case, we do have another um, location identified as an isolation um, area that is not in um, the infirmary or the dorms. So you can be assured of that. And, and Sarah does have um, some assistance to help her through this year, a, a second um, on-call nurse. So uh, we feel good about our, our staffing in that area. A final question that came in prior in this area, Joe. Um, as long as the resident student stays within the safe required environment in Maine, but specifically in Freiburg, thinking about having friends in the area and potentially signing out for a weekend, are we going to entertain that request? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something we don't wanna rule out, rule out from the beginning. Um, and the first few weeks, of course, as we're trying to get everyone in and quarantined and cleared through, we're gonna kind of have a limited uh, travel 
off campus into uh, day student homes. But as we go and we can create a good protocol and um, this really goes down to the compacts and people kind of following those uh, procedures that are outlined there that everyone, everyone will go through um, soon, that I, I, we're hopeful that we can find a way to keep that um, longstanding practice going. Thanks for the supportive comment, Ms. Owens. Um, let's see, I'm seeing a specific question just prior. When will kids receive key fobs and should we send a check for the food, um, you know, for meals on the first day? Will this be on the student ID? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think the question, the key fobs, you mean like a key card? Uh, those will be given out on new student, or, new student orientation. Uh, and then, the, yes, the, the money for the food court goes on the student ID. So you can send a check into the school or uh, I think as you can pay online as well, right, Joe? Yeah, so actually that brings up a um, good point. We haven't actually told you when the first day of school is or <laughs> new student orientation. I think I mentioned it, didn't But I? you'll be happy to know it is the same as we put on our calendar five months ago. So some things don't change. But the um, on, two, on Thursday, September 3rd, we ask um, all freshmen and new students to come to campus where we'll provide um, the key card and give more of that information. Many day students will also receive a mailing over the next two weeks at home that we'll have some more information on this. Uh, the good news is uh, on the third, there'll be a free lunch. So no matter what economists tell you, there is such thing as a free lunch and we'll have that on September 3rd. And then all students will be on campus um, and starting classes in earnest on the, uh, the Tuesday following Labor Day. So uh, we're excited to see everybody back on that date. But um, if you're not set up with food, with money on your key card and everything on the third, it's no problem. All that information will be forthcoming. So I think this is a good time to move into really the last substantive section of this reopening framework. Um, and that is section six. Actually, I just note that section seven, the very final, um, the very final portion of the framework is about how we will communicate to various stakeholders in different situations. And certainly we'll take questions about that if there are questions currently about communication plans. But um, I think, again, as far as substance, we're going to finish this evening in taking a look at the, the community compact that we're going to put in front of everybody who has a stake in in-person learning on campus at Freiburg Academy to open the school year in this, in this continuing time of um, COVID-19 virus transmission. Um, everything that you see here, and I believe that the categories of, of attention number, let's see, um, five, uh, it really sort of wraps up in a bow all of the earlier portions of our plan and asks that whoever you are, whether you're a student, whether you are an employee of the school, or whether you are a parent um, responsible for a student at the school, that, that we all actually physically sign our agreement to the provisions of this compact. And that's not this particular document that you're looking at. We will turn this into a, you know, um, separate document with a signature line uh, for everybody that I just named to be returned to the school to signal um, our agreement with the provisions. But basically, we, we like this word compact and we adapted this from a university model, scaled it way down, tailored it to describe you know, aspects of our own community needs in a high school setting. Um, but we like the word compact rather than code of conduct or agreeing to requirements because this is really about everybody's mutual interest and um, uh, agreement with these provisions as being what's necessary in order for this to be the safest space possible with the most mitigated risk possible because we prize a return to school and an opportunity to 
uh, return to in-person learning. Um, and we feel very fortunate to live in an area where that is um, safely possible. There are so many other areas of our country currently that are struggling with this return to school, whatever the details may be, because it is not as safe, because, it, because they are areas um, of much higher risk. And, and currently, we're, we're blessed um, to be in an area of low risk. To keep it that way and to guard against the, the risk that does exist, um, we need for you and we need for our students and we need for each other here on campus to really regard this as a, as a, as a covenant. Um, we, we will do this for ourselves and we will do this for each other. Um, and if, if at such time any community member finds that it cannot comport with any aspect of this compact, then we need to look at an alternative plan um, for, for that person. And for a student, it would mean um, taking a look at remote learning rather than in-person learning. Um, as, as one potential response. There are a number of aspects here uh, of, of, of what you're agreeing to and what we'll be agreeing to that we can't monitor as a school. We don't wish to monitor things that happen, as Joe said. I mean, kids are on campus for six hours of the day, and you know, then you have um, uh, the other 18. Um, and and the, the compact here is, is um, meant as just the, the sort of ethical um, agreement on your part that in those 18 hours you and your child um, you know are signing on to these being the wisest courses of action that that um, that you will follow and that you know that we're following in our private lives too so that those six to seven to eight shared hours of time on campus can be as safeguarded as possible as I say uh, we'll be getting this to you in a different format in order that um, you can look it over and you can talk it over and um, you and your child or children can sign and return it uh, just as I and my employees will be doing um, ourselves as, as members of the community. Uh, we'll be referring to the compact a lot. You've already heard um, several of us in this meeting referring to the compact, you know, um, it, it, it will have the strength and the force that we all bring to it in our adherence. And uh, we really trust that, um, that that will make it strong, that we have a community that's very interested in being adherent because it understands the value of school, in-person school, uh, a school community, and all of the connections, however weird it's gonna look for a while as we all show up in our masks and, and um, you know, resist the impulse to hug and to shake hands and everything that we've all been getting used to for the last couple of months. Uh, we understand the value of being back together and all of the good things that school really is about once we get used to, you know, this, this layer of caution. So please don't hesitate to contact me um, or anybody on the task force, anybody that you see on the uh, here participating in the meeting tonight with questions specific to this compact. And if there are any now, I'm happy to address them as I can. Thank you, I appreciate, I appreciate those, those supportive comments. And I also wanna extend my appreciation and voice it for, um, for the task force. Uh, we've all worked hard on putting this together. I trust you understand it's a fluid document as, as it says um, you know, in its early pages because we need to be responsive to changing conditions in Maine and throughout the country. Um, I also really wanna thank our faculty and staff, I think two thirds of whom, maybe a little, maybe a little more than that, returned in person yesterday for an optional uh, set of meetings on campus so that we could do the very same thing together that we're doing with you right now. Go over the, go over the framework, take their questions, get their insights. And they, they came and they offered them. And between then and uh, when we sent this document out to you last evening, it, it got much sharper. It got much more useful because of that contribution. But it was also just really, really great to see them. 
it's been it's been lonely um, and uh, it's a big campus as Joe said you know we're, we're at I think we're at 106 acres and it's been peopled by I don't know somewhere between seven and 21 people since March uh, on on any given weekday and it, it's time to get people back and it was great to see our um, it was great to see our teaching force and our staff um, and our staff community back. And we really look forward to three and four weeks from now as more and more student groups come in. And then four weeks from today on September 8th, when we have our first full school day of the 2020, 2021 school year. I appreciate your good faith and your participation tonight and look forward to more exchanges and working with you. Earlier, I think it was Joy, if I'm remembering, who asked how parents can help. Um, well, this is, a, this, is, this is a great first step, you know, your attendance this evening. And I would add, just, just by being the very best supporters of the compact that you can be, um, the, the, the partnership with home and what we're asking for is invaluable. It will make or break this endeavor, and I don't believe that we're talking about breaking it, but for any school, that partnership will make or break the return to campus, and we're, we're really um, just leagues ahead because we know we have your good faith and partnership. So thank you, and looking forward to more exchange and partnership as we move forward. Take care. <laughs>